Um, a little bit different today, as I'm mic'd up, I need to stay still. I'm not somebody who stays still. I walk a room when I train and I'm all over the place, so today is going to be a bit different for me. Um, welcome again. Um, it was nice that my place of work said that we could use this building, so um, I'm really grateful for that. Um, there's no fire alarm. We do have people who work on a Saturday, but there's no fire alarm. So if there is a fire alarm, please follow Hannah and I and we'll take you to a safe place. Um, the toilets are just out through the corridor. Um, turn left and the, the ladies is the first door, gentlemen is the second door. Um, we will have a break this morning. We're having lunch and we've got some fun things um, planned for this afternoon. Most of all, I want you to protect yourselves in this morning. It's not um, a nice pink fluffy subject that is great and, and fun and lovely. It's really serious. Um, and I understand that not everybody has um, a mum and dad upbringing with brothers and sisters and a pony in the garden and pets and all the other lovely stuff that some people go through some horrendous stuff as a childhood. So I need you to protect yourself in this. Um, outside this door, straight down to the corridor, there's a door that has available and unavailable on a slide. It's a lounge and it's, it's, um, it is just like your front room. There's sofas in there, there's a fireplace, there's lamps, there's cushions. If anything from um, this morning or today just hits uh, somewhere and lands somewhere in you that you just need some time out, there's a nice quiet room that you can go and I'm sure that with a too deep rule, somebody will come with you to make sure that you're okay. <laughs> I just need to remember that when I go off and off. Okay, so let's have a look. A bit of fun, okay? A bit of an icebreaker. You've got some plain paper, you've got some pens on your table. I want you to think about, if you were a piece of music, which piece of music would you be and why? Okay? If you were an item of food, what would you be and why? What smell best reflects your personality and why? We have some great answers to these. Which drink are you most like and why? And if you could choose any other voice that would reflect your personality, not your own, whose would it be and why? Okay, and we'll share back to the room. Okay, have a go. <laughs> So you can just put one to five and then just put your answer next to it. Okay, so some learning outcomes today. So we look at the terms abuse. We'll understand how to protect individuals from harm, abuse and neglect. It's about recognising the different types of harm, abuse and neglect, and we'll do a little bit of group work on that. It's how to report it, which if, if there's a disclosure at camp that you'll know what to do for that. And of course, your own role in relation to safeguarding, which is really, really important. <coughs> Excuse me. So, the All Wales Protection Procedures says what is child abuse? And child abuse, um, a child is abused or neglected when someone inflicts harm or fails to prevent harm. And that sticks in my throat big time because how would you, why would you not prevent harm to a child? Children may be abused by family or an institution or a community setting by those who have known them. More really a stranger. How many times have we said to our children, stranger danger? Um, most cases the abuser will know who the um, abuser is. Um, a young uh, child, a young person up to the age of 18 can suffer abuse or neglect and require protection via interagency protection and plan. So everybody is responsible. It is everybody's responsibilities and policies and procedures alone can't protect our children. Okay, we're going to do some group work now. Do you want to come and help me because I'm wired up? I want you to think about types of abuse. You're going to have something written down and I'm going to, there's pens on your paper, on your table. Just divide those up. The tables, okay. yeah. Do one first and then go around some more. So just think of the types of abuse. Don't worry about spelling. If they were spell check on flip chart paper, I would be a multi-billionaire and I would be far away. Um, not here today on a Saturday. So just think of the types of abuse. You've got neglect, you've got um, physical, you've got substance misuse, you've got abandonment, um, you've got emotional and you've got sexual. Okay, so we'll just have a few moments on this. This should be enough to go around. So think of the heading on your paper, some of you will have two, 
think of the types of abuse that is linked to that heading, okay? You ready, guys? Like hitting, you know, pinching, punching, kicking, biting, smacking, that kind of stuff. Obviously, yeah. uh, burning, yeah. pushing or shoving, um, using objects against a child, strangling, um, breaking bones, um, uh, shaking. And then we had like physical exertion because there was that case in America where that. Grandma got the child to run for like three hours. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. That kind of like over physical um, exertion yeah. or stress position or waterboarding, that kind yeah. of stuff. And then Munchausen's. Yeah. Mm. And we we'll look at that a bit later. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that's physical for us. Okay. Anybody got anything else to add? No. Okay. I think you've got most of these. Um, you said about breaking bones. Um, my daughter had an accident on a tree swing. Um, a long time ago, I was um, training to do a half marathon at the time. My husband rang me, um, where are you? I said, I'm about a mile from home, I'll be there soon. When I got there, um, there was a bank and a tree swing and out she went, about 18 foot swung out, come back. And my youngest daughter thought she'd jump on too um, and knocked my older one off and she fell and landed and didn't move. And Phil was in his parents' woods with the dogs and the kids and against all protocol, scooped her up and just told my daughter to run with the dogs and legged it towards the house because she was in the middle of the woods there was in the middle of nowhere um, when I got there she was very grey <coughs> excuse me very grey very sullen leaves and dirt everywhere and so I just said put it in the car we're going to the hospital so grabbed a jacket and a banana got it into the car and we got to the hospital and they parted us and interrogated us and looked after Harriet she'd fallen on some glass so her face was completely um, completely torn to shreds. They thought that she'd punctured a lung and various other things. So off she went for different x-rays. She didn't break anything. Um, and they gave her some eye ointment for her face because it wouldn't cause it to dry and crest, which it wouldn't scar. Um, and if you looked at Harriet now, you would never know that she was in such a serious um, accident. But the, I said, you know, I think she's broken bones, her breathing and all the rest of it. Her jaw looked bad, but it was swollen. And he said, to break a child's bone is really, really difficult because they're quite pliable. So he said, the force that you need to, shape, to break a, a child's bone is absolutely immense. So when we talk about um, broken bones, you can just think about the trauma that they've gone through. Um, the news this week, the little boy who was shaken to, to death and battered with a, um, a garden chair, um, the force of that, unbelievable. So physical, yes, ha marks that can hide and they know where to hit and what to do to hide, but also <coughs> the marks that, that will show as well. Okay, um, uh, afflicted by a parent, caregiver, any other person who's responsible for the child, um, it's considered abusive even if it was an intended harm. Who had, on our next one, who had neglect? Was that you as well? Okay. What did you have? Uh, so we put things like no food, um, basic hygiene, um, leaving them alone, yeah. um, unattended illnesses or conditions, yeah. if there's anything wrong with them, so, and not going to medical appointments, Yes. Um, not proper living, like beds and things like that. Um, we put not enough like attention and communication, yeah. um, not suitable clothing, uh, no stimulus, so like no toys and yeah. or anything like that, and then not education or school absence. Yes, yeah, brilliant. Anybody got anything else? So yeah, you've covered most of these. Um, it's about providing for a child's basic needs, isn't it? Um, so you've got the food, shelter, the medication, um, education, failure to provide psychological ca care, and also permitting a child to use drugs or alcohol. And I've put some stuff there that says, words have power, use them wisely. And they really do. I've worked with people, I've coached people who have been told that they're stupid, that they're not worth anything, that you know, why were they even born? They were a mistake. And they carry those limiting beliefs right up into adulthood. Uh, we had banned words in our house. Shut up was one of them. Stupid was another one. Um, and, you know, if you, that was, um, that was a big uh, telling off if those were used because we just didn't want that environment for our children. I, my, one of my best friends was told all every day that she was stupid and she grew up to believe she's stupid. She's now a doctor, so she's not stupid. Yes, and we'll come on to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
definitely. Um, and that's worrying. And we'll talk about that. Okay, the next slide was abandonment and substance misuse. Is that you guys yeah, at the back? We actually get a lot of DNA testing into our abandonment. Yeah, and they and do come in there. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. So that brings visitors if they're dealing. Um, so you don't know quite who's coming onto the premises. They may be an asset. Um, there was a case that um, a five-year-old was a runner for mum, um, taking 10 bags round to the community and bringing money back because nobody expected a small child um, until it was out, child was out late one night and um, off-duty police officer noticed the activity. Um, yes, abandonment, neglect comes into it big time. Um, don't know where the whereabouts are. Children are left um, and can have serious harm. The risk of leaving children has rocketed in Newport alone, but in South Wales and across the UK, mm -hmm. of parents going back to work and not having adequate childcare. So leaving children, um, one case was in Newport where the child was chained um, mm -hmm. in the lounge so that um, they couldn't have any accidents or anything and food was just left with the child while um, mum worked um, and those sort of cases are not unheard of they're very very common which is incredibly sad um, so failed um, to maintain contact all that sort of stuff will come into it and as we said you know selling distributing you don't know who's coming on the premises you don't know what they're allowing in um, what the child can get hold of um, all that sort of stuff will come into it okay who had emotional abuse I think that was you so we had uh, shaming, um, general verbal abuse, criticism, lack of physical affection, inappropriate expectations, ignoring, blaming, terrorizing, abandoning, and never giving any positivity or any praise, um, being distance and, and absence, and manipulating, rejection, and corrupting and exploiting. Yeah. Yeah, very good list. Um, it's about the child's emotional development, isn't it, um, and sense of self-worth. And as I've said, people carry that um, on through into adulthood. Talking to um, a doctor in our church, um, and he said that from 16 months onward, they'll need help later on in life, that stuff is so cemented there and in the ways that they think and feel and how they function, that from 16 um, months on, they will need to be some professional development later on in life. Um, conveying a child is worthless. We always had um, my kiss, kutch and squeeze tank is empty when my children was little. So we'd say my kiss tank is empty so I'd have to have 20 kisses, <coughs> 20 hugs or 20 squeezes and it was just to let the child know that they were loved and it was an environment where they, we valued them and they were worth. Um, so <coughs> it's really difficult when you see, and I can see it in adults now, you know, that they have no, they, no self-worth, there's, you know, who would love me, I'm nothing, I'm a nobody. You can see that their childhood, when you go back and you get to know them, they just haven't had that loving relationship with an adult um, or a caregiver. So a child not, um, might be given a child opportunities to express their views. Um, you know, the children should be seen and not heard. It's taken to a, the nth degree that children can't express themselves. When you look at the brain development of a child up into their teens, late teens, um, the, de the brain is still developing and we expect them to behave in a manner which really they can't function in that way. Their emotional stuff is not quite developed, they don't understand the wider context, all that sort of stuff, but we accept, expect them to behave as adults and they're not their children. Um, silencing them, making fun, 
uh, making fun of how they communicate. And some people, some of the children on the camp might, for the first time, be relaxed enough to open up about things um, because they've always been shot down. You know, um, um, and you might find that that will be some of the progression that might happen. And when it does, it's beautiful because they find themselves a little bit and they're able to express themselves. Um, inappropriate expectations, yeah, we expect them to, to, uh, to act as an adult rather than a child that they are. Okay, last one was sexual abuse. I think that's the table at the back. Yep. Brilliant, great list. <coughs> so yeah, um, you said about pornographic materials, about non-contact visual activities, watching sexual acts, encouraging children to behave sexual in inappropriate ways. There might be something that children that you have that just act way beyond their years, that will be so sexualized that they will do things that you just shouldn't be seen in a child. Um, and you may see some of those behaviours at camp. We've got gangs on there about girls being passed around and being filmed without their cassette consent. So grooming on the internet, you mentioned that, massive. And parents, you know, not putting protection onto, um, on, a, uh, on their site. We're very careful of what the girls watch and what they have access to. Um, and we've done it. We had horses. We put in pony bridles. My daughter just got off the chair that was next to us. She was eight at the time to go to the loo and um, BDSM site come up and various other stuff. And all we put in was a pony bridle. So even the bags on your table, they're called fiddle kits. I had to be so careful of how I look for those to buy them as training tools because you put it in, the stuff that comes up is absolutely horrendous. So yes, yeah, so... Um, so there's lots of stuff in there. Gangs, um, there's a lot of gang culture that's, um, we're, we're finding there's more, there's more gang culture. I think that being in the, the, involved with the people that we're involved with and the police and trafficking and various other stuff, that's coming up more and more now <coughs> that you've got to belong to a gang and the initi initiation of a girl being passed around a group. And if you're passed around, then you're in the gang and some gangs are better to be long in and others so you can go through that humiliation because you really don't want to be with the other gang all those sort of things will come into it um, and then filming it um, and putting it on websites and various other things um, that's my phone not the mouse um, domestic abuse just wanted to put some stuff in about domestic abuse that the statistics show that there's 70 percent of chance that where an adult is is involved with domestic abuse that a child is being abused um, in 90 percent of the cases the children in the same room when the the parent is attacked um, and there's been a lot of a lot of law change around this about domestic abuse so it's identified at risk under the adoption of children's acts of two, 2002 um, and from the 31st of January 2005, Section 120 of the Act extended the legal definition of harming children to include harm suffer suffering by seeing or hearing ill treatment of others, including domestic abuse. So um, <clears throat> the, that's massive. We've now, in, within work, got a whole new domestic abuse team that's come in. We're working multi-agency with other housing organisations to look at the tenants that we have and the domestic abuse that goes on because it's absolutely rocketing and through the roof. We see that it, um, child abuse, um, domestic abuse um, rockets when we have big events on. So the football now, so the cheap, the cheap drinks, the football, the losing, the winning, whatever, um, they find that... Um, child line will go up probably 70% in cases of children ringing in because of abuse and domestic abuse will be reported 40% um, more than what it normally is during times of things like football and all the rest of it. Not blaming football, I'm just seeing the culture of drinking and together and all that sort of stuff. Another one is organised abuse, so one or more abuser, that might be um, a part of um, um, the father, uncles, um, brothers, friends, um, those coming in who were drug de uh, dealing drugs, that it may be that they let them have time with their daughter, um, not to pay for the drugs. 
lots of various stuff that will go on there um, and that's growing as well I mean everything seems to be getting worse but um, yeah this framework in place and you know other children might be abusing other children you might find that and we'll talk about that at camp and some of the scenarios of trial trauma um, you brought up Munchausen which is fabricated illness um, of when parents or caregivers f give false accounts massive case in America where the children moved state so many times they couldn't keep tabs and the child was almost having heart surgery because they'd given certain stuff that would slow heart rates down and various stuff because the mum craved the attention and it was only somebody who just was spot on and just said something is not right and looked into it that there was actually nothing that when they did the right tests and various other things and looked into it big time um, the mother was poisoning the daughter to get the results that she wanted because she loved the, the attention at the hospital and all that that gave so really quite sick that you're, it, it feeds you when you're harming um, a child but is recognised. Another one that we may not come a, a, up against but we may, um, I just thought I'd put it in, is spiritual abuse, um, you know, in the name of God or religion. Um, we do street pastors, we've got friends who um, used to go to Catholic church and she said that she became a Christian because she was so frightened of going to hell that she gave her life to God. Um, because that was just too much for her to handle. Um, in later life, she realised, you know, the love of Jesus and the God and the Holy Spirit in the right context, and she, she rededicated her life. But the fear of religion and God that some parents um, or caregivers have on children is unbelievable. So you might not come across it, but it, I just wanted to put it in there because um, I think it's good. Yeah? Has um, the increase come about as a result of more education like this? It does. Um, when I started um, POVA and safeguarding here, the amount of cases that were reported went up. Um, and, you know, which was a good thing because now it meant that um, some of our operatives, because I look after four companies and uh, what was the Sarah and Umbrella, um, the operatives that go in to fit bathrooms, kitchens, plumbing, heating, whatever, was recognising child abuse. Children were home um, in the middle of the day, they were running around without clothes on. Um, it was a school day, there was very little food, there was drug paraphernalia around the place. Um, Mum had black eye and an arm in a sling and would wear long sleeve tops because of the bruising. So they got to, to recognise that actually this isn't right, it's not a case of it's nothing to do with me, I'm here, I'm going to fit a kitchen, I'm going to leave. It was a case of actually we need to pass this on, we need to raise concern. So when, we, when you start doing training, it does, because it opens the eyes to what sometimes what people just don't think about. I mean, you talk about human trafficking, most people will say, oh, I know it's terrible, you know, that happens abroad. And, you know, we've had lover boys at the end of our street here. You know, trafficking comes through Newport at phenomenal amounts of people. So it's just that, you know, self-awareness that people don't have. So, um, and I think it's, when you look at culture, when you've got young girls who are still children really themselves, having children, don't have the extended family, don't have grandparents, don't have mum and dad, um, don't have aunts and uncles around them, you know, a sausage roll and a can of Coke is a stable diet for a baby, you know, they just not aware um, and some of them just crave love um, and that's found in an abusive relationship and the cycle continues. So. I think there's lots of factors, but I think when you start doing training, people are a little bit more open to it and are willing then to step out and go, actually, I do have a responsibility. I'm not going to leave it for someone else. Um, and they will report it. Some hot topics. Do you want to do hot topics? No? no? Okay, hot <laughs> topics. <laughs> um, today's society is various. I mean, some people think of abuse as you only sit into sexual abuse or physical abuse or emotional abuse. They all intertwine, they're all a golden thread, you know, there's always that neglect, the psychological stuff that goes on, there's the sexual stuff, there's lots of other stuff that go in. These are some of the hot topics that we're facing at the moment, you know, child trafficking, child exploitation. Um, FGM, I mean, you know, it's a, we've done a lot of work even here in the Seren group about that because of the, some of the clients that we have but they'll take their children abroad to have it done and bring it back because they see it's a privilege to have it done. So it's about fighting for that and how we can work with them. Forced marriages, you know, honor-based violence, the, the online grooming, all that sort of stuff, um, and private fostering, 
when something have happened to parents and then the aunts and uncles turn up to take the child away, um, that sort of stuff. Um, it's massive. I mean, where the, there's many or where there's many, because life is cheap, um, and there can be um, pleasure taken from the profanity of it, then it will happen. So some of the hot topics, I just wanted to just put that up um, for you. Um, significant harm um, in the Children's Act, significant harm is the threshold that justifies compulsory intervention in family life in order to protect children. So the local authorities have a, a statutory duty um, to make inquiries where there's reasonable cause for, um, to suspect that a child who lives or is found in the area is suffering from significant harm. So this is the criteria that they look at. It could be a single act, it could be a long-term act. So significant harm is massive. And I think before we go on to behaviours associated with abuse, and this will come into the children that you've got and what they'll be displaying, and I think this will be the most important part for you because you'll be able to recognise some of how they're acting and be able to um, work accordingly. I think we'll just take five-minute comfort break. Just top up your teas and coffees or your cold drinks. Go to the toilet, straight down the corridor, turn left, and it's through the doors. And we'll just come back a quarter past um, just to go on to the next part. Okay, two things before we move on. Do you want some paper? <laughs> She's using a manual, great. Thanks. <laughs> okay, two things before we go on. Are we all, doing, are we all okay? Yeah. Just want to do a check that we're all all right. Yeah, okay. Just to clarify, um, private fostering. Um, I'm not saying anything about fostering. Private fostering is when um, family members, really non-family members, turn up to take a child. Or, um, as we're finding, we, Phil and I belong to a charity, we're trustees for a charity in Newport, and they um, counsel children, um, young people, um, men and women, in sexual trauma and various other things. And um, they have counsellors coming in to counsel the counsellors because of some of the stuff that they're dealing with at the moment. So um, private fostering is the sort of children that are born underneath a radar, um, a soul or paedophile rings, um, child sacrifices, all that sort of stuff. So this is nothing to do with the legal system of fostering that has all the law, the policies and procedures and the right people in place. This is the underground stuff that isn't, um, doesn't come under anything, really doesn't exist. Um, except in the dark circles. So that's where I was coming with that, just to sort of clarify that. So you're not talking about private agencies? Not private agencies about. at all, no, just need to clarify that, definitely. There's some brilliant um, private fostering agencies around. This is, the, this is the dark undercover black stuff. Okay, so this hopefully will help you with the children that you're having. So this is behaviours associated um, with abuse. So they're influenced by different factors from abuse and neglect. That two children might have the same abuse and might, might react in very different ways to things. Um, we've seen it with adults. Um, we, we had two guys who worked in a prison. There was a, a fire in the prison. One went in to put the fire out. Behind him, the door shut. And the, the inmate was in there and almost killed him. By the time the other um, prison guards got in, got him out, got him to... Um, to hospital, etc., etc. He did eventually go back to work. Two of them that was on duty, the one that was beaten up and the one that went in to help, totally different, tra traumatized in totally different ways. Two of the guys that went in, um, one started to come into work late, um, started to get quite angry, um, started to smell of alcohol, and he couldn't cope. Now these guys were sort of six foot two, six foot four, huge guys who went in to help their mate. Both had exactly the same experience, both absolutely different scenarios. The guy did get help, he went back to work and everything was okay. The same with children, they might have the same abuse but will react to it in very, very different ways. Um, having said that, there is a thread that will go through, that will behaviours will come through from um, certain types of abuse and you will see that. So neglect, so we said about the developmental delay um, and I've put lots on these slides and the handouts for you to remember and take away and go back through them. Low self-worth is a massive thing, which ev whatever the neglect, the abuse is, that will be running through it. Poor socialising skills and they don't know how to act in certain positions. So you might have children who say stuff that are really inappropriate or just so wacky you just can't understand where they're coming from 
but they've never been interacted, they've never had those social skills, they just haven't had that grounding. Um, they may not know proper boundaries, um, and I think it's really good that you're playing the video where they, you talk about touch and various other stuff that you sit down with the children so that they know that baseline, so you can always refer back to that. So they won't understand proper boundaries. If you're a child who has been left, that you, you, whatever food you find in the house, that's what you eat. Um, you haven't had the development, the stimulation, um, all that sort of interaction with the world, then you are, you are really not going to know how to behave in a formal setting because you have just um, looked after yourself, all that stealing food to make sure that you've got food. There's, there'll be a lot of uh, signs associated. So you need to just really have an overall picture that things are going to happen. You're going to think, that's really bizarre for a, way to, for a child to behave, but there's underlying stuff to that. They may crave personal attention. Um, because you might be the first person who has really spent some time with them in such a fun environment, away from that caregiver, that parent, that sort of, that sort of setting, that in school, because you don't know how to behave, you haven't had those social skills, you're always being told off with a teacher, you're always sat um, outside the headmistress or headmaster's room. So, you know, you, you just don't have those skills. So they may crave personal attention. You've got to be very careful about uh, personal attachment um, at the camp as well. That's really important. So physical abuse, um, fearful and withdrawn, might not like the authorities. Um, there may be loads of stuff we could unpack with that. They may be hostile and aggressive because that's what they model. Um, just saying to somebody now in the break that my cousin um, fostered two children. Um, a six-month-old baby and a little boy who was, I think he was about 12 months, 13 months. You said hello to him and he'd stick his middle finger up at you. The words that he spoke were absolutely horrendous. The language that came out of him, because that was the environment that he was in. And if he couldn't have anything, he just completely went violent. There was none of this negotiation, there was none of this no, here's your boundaries, none of that. This little kid was just the most angry little ball of gorgeousness um, that I've ever seen and it was the environment that he was in and through a lot of work he he they did incredible he's a lovely little boy and he's gone to a permanent home um, and they had him and his sister so you know a happy ending but still some work to do because of the stuff that is so ground in from birth um, situations might trigger fearful and aggressive reactions you know ch children will cry easily because it's a way that they they may react to something they may not cry they might hurt themselves really badly but they're not going to show that they, they they're weak because um, of crying so they're going to behave in very very different ways um, and you know just by saying to somebody no this isn't what we're going to do we're not going to do this could set another child off because that have led to um, than being smacked or abused or whatever. So you need to just be mindful of some of the behaviours that might manifest and they might be quite bizarre to you because, you, because of the environment that they've been in. Sexual abuse, um, children might want to sleep with their clothes on. Um, they might sleep under the bed, they might sleep in a corner, that to them a bed is not a safe place because of what has happened. Um, you know, and if you're doing stuff in the evening, be careful of your language. You know, nighttime games might be going for a candlelit walk around the grounds or, you know, something fun to them. Nighttime games might mean something very, very different. So you really, really have to think about the language that you use with the children. Um, they might avoid physical contact completely because the only touch they know is either incredibly harsh or it's sexualized. Um, they may be sexualized to a, a lesser or a, a higher degree. Children acting out sexual acts because that's all they know um, can be quite distressing and it's how you, uh, you work with that. Um, and it's about children abusing other children you need to think about as well. So um, because it may be the first time that they might have a little power that they can, they can dominate someone else rather than going to get them before they get me first type mentality. So you need to just have that in your back of your mind as well. Emotional and uh, psychological abuse, uh, maybe mistrusting of others, especially if they've had a very harsh time and it's been really bad. You, you, they may mistrust you. Again, low self-worth comes in. There'll be development, mental delays. Um, and some of not know how to act in different settings. Um, they might sabotage their own happiness 
because they've always been failed and let down. They promised the kitten or the dog or to have an ice cream or to go and play in the sunshine or go to the park and it's never come to anything. So some of them will sabotage great things because they don't want, they know they're going to be let down. So rather than build themselves up to, I'm going to go to a party, I can dress up and we're going to have, it'll be like, no, I'm going to do something destructive because I know that that's not going to happen anyway. It never happens for me. So you've got to work with that sort of behaviour as well. Um, they're not ready to believe that you care about them. Why would you, a stranger, care about them? There's been lots of strangers in their lives. They've gone from placement to placement. Um, lots of people have come and gone. Why would you be any different? So you're going to have to work very hard for a trust factor um, because they're not going to trust you. Some might. Some might just go, it's somebody different. I need love and be all over you and someone might be very withdrawn. So it's managing those expectations as well. Just because we put the spiritual abuse in, you know, problems we relate in, again, our language, how you speak to children. Um, I, we joked about this last night, and I think Misty, you were the example, you know, um, the blood of the lamb and the Holy Ghost inside you, and you know, sanctification and justification. You get all this stuff, and it's just like, mm. To most people, if you say you're lost, it's like, no, I'm not. I know where I am. I'm in Newport. They don't relate to the stuff of, of uh, Christian stuff. So our language sometimes and how we say so really need to rein it in. Um, if their father, stepfather, the father figure have abused them, they will have huge troubles um, just trusting and relating to God the Father because the father figure in their life have abused them. So again, it's the language that you use. They'll have an inability to trust God. They'll, ref they'll fear receiving from him. I know that you can't pray over children, but you know that sort of thing will come in because again, if it's a religious background, they'll put the fear of God literally in the child. And some of them will feel that they're just too bad for God, that you know who would love them after what they've been through. So just wanted to put a little bit about that in. So two key elements for child trauma is witnessing something threatening or harmful to self or to other or perceiving the situation is beyond one's um, coping ability. So not all acts of abuse um, and neglect are traumatising. Um, some kids have incredible thick skins and will deal with an awful lot. And if you don't know the context behind stuff, it's the norm, it's the way of life. Why would it be traumatising? Because this is how life is. Um, Children can also be traumatised by situations that do not involve abuse or neglect. So, you know, simple things could trigger memories and could kick off. Um, don't think because a child drops their ice cream and starts screaming, um, another child starts screaming, that that's a traumatic thing. It might just be she's dropped her ice cream when she wanted it. Do you know what I mean? Not everything is going to link back to a traumatising event or neglect or abuse. So reactions, the impact of it, that, you know, people will deal with things in very different ways. weak. Some might recoil, so the natural feelings of coping behaviours in the aftermath of the traumatised situation. Others need reorganisation, so they need professionals to come in and to do the step-by-step, -step, the walk-through. Um, the organisation we um, trustees for, they do art therapy. And because children can't express what has happened um, and what's gone on, they don't know that it's not what should happen. Um, they do a lot of stuff, stuff through play, f play therapy and art therapy. And we've seen some of the stuff that they've done and it's really frightening. Um, we went to Christmas time, I was telling you in the break, um, one lady said, oh, isn't that lovely? That's baby Jesus in a manger. And I looked at Phil and I said, no, that's got a dagger through its heart and it's on a pentagram. That isn't baby Jesus in a manger. Um, so they can work with children to express things that they can, haven't got the words to be able to express or the understanding to know what that is and even start to unpack that. But through play um, and through the art therapy, they're able to do that. So there's lots of professionals who can work with them to work through that at such a young age, right up into adulthood. So how do you respond to children? And I've put this in on a couple of slides. Listen, listen, listen. It validates the one who's speaking. If Hannah asks me a question and I'm busy fiddling with my notes or getting a drink and yeah, yeah, and I just, even as an adult, you'd be, she's not listening to me, she's not paying attention. As children, they have probably been told to just be out of the way until they're needed for stuff. So um, 
it's really important to validate them. Their children get down on their level. There's nothing worse than an adult towering over a child. Um, I'm quite tall, so I tower over most people. But, you know, I look up to some people. And, you know, if you're in that situation, it can be a little bit... Oh, so get down on your, you know, get down on, your, uh, on their level. Have a chat with them eye to eye. Open body language. Be careful of your tones that you use. They might just be used to harsh tones and half stuff. You know, be that gentle voice. Talk to them, listen, show that, you're, you're, that they are valuable. It might be a first for a child, and it shows respect to a child. Some of them have had a hard time and might not have, have had been shown much respect to the point that they're at now. Um, and about... I don't know whether you've had a lot to do with listening to people who've had problems or, or you know, trying to help out. But there's nothing wrong with silence either. Don't try and fill a gap of silence after they're talking to you. That might be the time for them to be thinking about what they're going to say to you next. They might not be able to say something to somebody who happens to them. So don't try and say, oh, you know, just listen. I, um, I know Hannah's a street pastor as well, and street pastors and I actually coordinated for Newport. I'm actually trained now as a response pastor, which is a new initiative dealing with uh, critical uh, emergencies and international scale things like terrorist attacks or bomb alerts, etc. I went away for a whole day training on this over and above street pastor training. And one thing I walked away from half past eight in the morning to half past five in the night, we listen, is that you lay flowers at the, at the site memorial service, listen. You might not have the answer. Because I know people, those children have never perhaps had any opportunity. So don't try and fill a gap with bullshit or good now. That might be their process of just saying more to you. Um, of course, don't, don't promise them anything you can't give them. Give them. But listening, if you get anything else to say, listen, listen. And ask to each other as well. You know, people in this group say, listening is so also, they might give you a little, inf little bit of information to see how you react. Because if you go, oh, my goodness, right, um, they're going to go, oh, I'm so not telling her what I wanted to tell her because she's just absolutely freaked out on me. So they may give you little bits of information to see and judge um, if they are going to open up to you or tell you something to see how you react. So you'll be watched. You'll be watched a great deal by your actions, by your words, when you, they think not nobody's watching they will be watching you because if they have a desire to think I really want to tell them they will they will judge you big time of weather and they'll give you little bits of information that okay could be quite bad could be sort of all right ish but just to see how you react they're not going to tell you straight out it's very rare that happens they'll give you little bits of information and they'll see how you react to it As I said, above all else, listen, listen, listen. Silent and listen have the same words in it. As adults, we listen generally to reply, to respond. Um, as soon as they come up for breath, we're in there because we know what, what you need to do is. What you, have you tried? Have you spoken to? We're there to try and fix. So it's about listening. And listening, as Phil said, is about those silences as well because the child is calculating on whether do they go on? Do they tell you any more? Is this the right time? Do I leave it? Do I chicken out? they're going to be, and it's their, they, might, they might be a reflector type personality that just need to just sit back two minutes before they go on to the next bit. So show acceptance of what a child says. Um, I'm quite animated um, and what's written on my face, we've laughed about this. Um, some of Phil's work stews when he wasn't a pastor and worked um, where he worked were in London and um, I sat next to the director of Disneyland Paris and the assistant director to Sony UK at one point um, and oh, Phil would look at me across the room and he'd go nice. just that now. listening how they'd only had nine holidays that year instead of 12 and you know all that sort of stuff and it was just like face so I'm quite animated so if they're going to say something it's about not showing shock not showing disgust it's that sort of thing it's it's the game face um, show acceptance, keep calm, look at the child directly, as we've already said. Be honest and tell the child that um, you will have to tell somebody else. You can't keep secrets, you can't, it's com you can't keep the confidentiality. It needs to be broken. This is serious stuff and you can't cope it on your own. Really, if a child does open up to you and talk to you, 
there's a process that you'll go through. But after that, just remember to look after yourself, that you'll need to debrief with somebody that you trust that will be recognised throughout the camp. That window's going to hit you in a minute, sorry. It's swinging open. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So that, that one. Um, so you you've got you you were, you have to look after yourself in this. Um, and as we said, with children, they can go through the same stuff. It can affect them differently. You might think, I don't need any pastoral care in this. I'm fine. But I think, as a part of course, as a part of the process, you do need to de talk to somebody and just get that off your chest and see where that lands in your life. So I really wanted to take that on board. So helpful responses tell them that they, they, you know they're doing the right thing by telling you that it must have been really hard they're glad that they've told them it's not your fault because with all the abuse there's a lot of stuff around it you know i'll kill your sister i'll kill your brother your dog will die your cat will die you know any possession you've got they'll take away adults know they shouldn't be doing this to children and they will do everything to keep it secret so you know it's never the child's fault um, and I will help you and that's something that you can do don't say you know why didn't you tell anyone before I can't believe it are you sure about this the who when why you're not Miss Marples you're not Poirot it's not for you to do the investigation you, you don't ask leading questions at all you can clarify that you're listening you can put things back to them you can give them what your next steps are do not ask leading questions please um, and don't make statements such as a false promises, but I'm shocked and, and don't tell anyone else. Can I just make, yeah. My understanding is the risk with asking questions who, what, where is that may compromise investigation back later on. It does. Yes, it so can. You, you know, it may turn out that you, in some way, suggest you fed the child things. Yes, yeah, definitely. There was a case um, in a home um, for disabilities um, a long time ago, right back in the early 80s, where a young girl. Um, had been sexually abused. Um, she told one of the carers, who was her favourite carer, um, and the carer said, what did he do to you? And it wasn't a he, it was a she. And in her capacity thought, if I say it's a she, she might not believe me. So she went along with a he. And of course, they didn't get anywhere because it wasn't a he, it was a she. So you can't ask those questions. You really, really, really have to rein it in and, and not ask those questions. And you really, your heart is going to go out for the child. You want to help them. You want to make sure that they're safe, that they're, you know, all the things are in, in place. But you could compromise that by, by leading questions. Um, again, we are sure of the child that they've done the right thing in telling you. Let them know what you're going to do next and what happens. Um, and I think you're the lead person. Sophie okay Sophie so Sophie will be the lead person so you need to go to Sophie and you need to explain what happens you will need to write it down in their words don't use your words <clears throat> it's not you're not writing an essay I woke up this morning the sky was blue the clouds were singing you know birds were singing there was clouds in the sky it's the facts of what happened it's using their words even if it doesn't make sense to you it's using their words you write down who's with you because you will never be on your own you will always be too deep or more so you write down who's with you you date it you sign it <laughs> all that sort of stuff and um, Sophie will go through um, when you're reporting it so you need to make sure that you you keep all that information it's really really important um, and as I got on the bottom there seek pastoral support I mean make sure that you debrief with someone it's really really important if you even if you feel you don't need it you have to do it um, it's it's one of the things I think that as a camp you need to do a couple of other things before we finish um, and we're gonna, I'm going to do a little exercise with you then just a fun exercise um, touch we know that there's no hugging there's no touching you can refer them back to the the video sometimes you can't help but a child is around your neck before you know it because they're so grateful for something it's you don't do prolonged hugging do you know what I mean it's about taking the child off you and tr we set up things like fist pumps and fiddling with their hair or doing something that is you know we did it with um we did it in our church with older and younger generation because the older generation laps and you know it's all it's like no child protection you can't so now we've got you know 
86-year-old fist pumping the kids as they walk into church in the morning. Do you know what I mean? It's great. So even in schools, when you have the six formers that look, go on the yard to look after the children, even they <coughs> model the non-hugging, non-touching, that they'll do a fist pump or a high five or something. Make sure that you get down to children's levels when you're talking, as I said, for eye contact. But there should be no hugging and no touching. And you've got a video to watch that you, they will watch with you that you can refer back to. So you've got that baseline, so it's no surprise. Remember the video that we watched? We can't do this. So what should we do? Let's have a funny handshake or let's have a funny... You can do something else with them. We've got no sitting on beds. The adults are not allowed to sit on children's bed and children are not allowed to sit on anybody else's bed. Major rule. And that's going to be massive for those who've experienced sexual abuse, that to have somebody come in and sit on their bed. Even if there's, there's no threat there, the emotion and the feelings that that's going to bring up is going to be horrendous for that child. So under no circumstances do you sit on anybody else's bed. Um, again, too deep, you're never alone, so you're always together. Assumptions, which I'm going to do a piece of work with you in a moment. Never, never make assumptions. So many things, people get into trouble because they make assumptions. Um, and we'll do a little piece of work just to highlight that. There's no phones, Facebook, they um, signed in, signed out, your location services yeah, need to be off. Don't mess with Abby if you've got your phone. Yeah. She'll be after you. Um, <laughs> if not, it will be confiscated for the whole of camp. Um, because of, the, the, of what you're doing for looked after children, I mean, there has to be specific rules that you have to abide. And this is the first one, and you want to get it right, mm -hmm. because if this is going to be a yearly event, um, you know, this, this is, you're going to have your application forms in before you even say what the dates are, because you're going to want people to be on it. Um, and they're going to want to be on it. So it's got to be run right. So you across social services and all that sector are going to be watched very closely to see how this runs. What you've done right, what you haven't done right. Is it something that they're going to trust? Is it something that they're going to use again? So it's got to be right. So Facebook, great tool, can have devastating effects when um, mishandled. Um, accidents obviously need to be reported. Who's your nurse? Okay, the lady who's not here is your nurse, um, <laughs> Paris, um, and she will have forms to fill in and, and stuff to sign and, and countersign and all the rest of it. And lastly, just remember false allegations. It can happen and it's really upsetting um, because there may be lots of things. It may be that somebody else is abusing them in the camp and they need somebody to get attention, so they'll cause a distraction to get that attention so that they can get to somebody to say they're abusing. It might be that as you're big, they've really, really got attached to you, that this has just been the most phenomenal experience. They don't want to go home um, and they don't want to say goodbye um, and they'll make a false allegation up to, to get away from you before they leave. Um, and it can happen. And, and again, our minds think, why? Why would that happen in the mind of a child? They think in many different ways and they will, as we talked about earlier, will sabotage their happiness because some of them were going back to stuff that is the reality of, of where they are and where they've been. So be prepared for false allegations. I think if there's a false allegation, the bigs will be changed. You'll have to make sure that they know the child's um, history and that sort of stuff. So there will be that swap over and there needs to be an investigation and you need to think about who that's going to be at the camp and, and what that looks like. OK, so um, they may happen and it's hurtful when it does because you just think, I've given that child everything this last three days. Why would they say I've done something like that? It's where they are. It's their mentality. It's how they've protected themselves. It's how they've got to where they are today without um, losing their life in some cases, which seems a bit far fetched, but it's true. So just please, please, please be careful of false allegations and just, you know, um, have a procedure in place that you cover yourself in that. So that's it. So hopefully you will know the children that's coming. You'll have a history on them. It's about the behaviours that they'll display. Um, it might not be appropriate in some um, places. It's how you deal with that. Make sure that you look after yourself every day, that if you're having a tough time, you debrief. Um, I know Sammy is the prayer person. What's your title? Prayer? Coordinator. Coordinator manager. <laughs> director. Um, and it might be stuff that, you know, this has brought up something for me. It may be that this is not sitting with me and I'm struggling with this. Um, whatever it is, and that people can, you know, surround you and pray for you and make sure that you get help. Are there any other questions? Can I just say something? I'm yeah. a childline counsellor. And referring back to what you said about um, uh, if they make a 
disclosure yeah. and saying it must have been difficult. Um, I don't know whether it works in this context, but we never say must. We okay. We say, I imagine it could have been difficult for yeah. you to tell me that. Just okay. in case yeah. it wasn't, it might be, well, they're much too far away. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's just kind of be mindful of the language that you use. Okay. And this was taken off the RFK stuff. So perhaps we need to think about language um, and what it means to us. Yeah. So we, c we can take the word must out, no problem, and put it with something else. That's a good point. Good point. And language is so important, isn't it? Because we say things without thinking sometimes, and it has massive effects. Like we never ask why. We never yeah. have to use the word why. We always say, yeah. um, I don't know, I'm wondering if it was, you know, we, we, when you, that word why is banned, it's too complicated to use. Yeah, I see the point in that. Yeah. Great. Anyone else? before we do a fun exercise. Okay, I'm gonna take this off if that's okay.